Welcome to our Christmas Eve gatherings. I don't, I don't know um, <clears throat> for you if this is a time that you love every year uh, or if Christmas Eve is something that you just do. It's just a tradition in your family. Uh, whatever brought you here tonight, um, it wasn't common sense uh, in this weather, but I am so thankful you're here. And personally, I love, I love Christmas Eve. Uh, I had the privilege this year of getting to do this gathering four times with four different groups of people, and I will love every moment of every one of them. And tonight, what we're hoping to create in this time together is a shared moment of peace, a, uh, a pause, a, a spiritual deep breath, if you will, uh, as we just take time to pause. Maybe you're taking time to pause for the first time in the last four weeks and where as a, as a church family, we just soak in this moment. We don't rush it. We take a deep breath and we remember together just how holy this time together really is as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And really, we all need now, perhaps more than ever, a reminder of what's holy and what's true and what's good. Without question, there's uh, no shortage of bad news out there. Everywhere you look, you can find bad news. In fact, uh, dictionary.com actually came up with a new word uh, that describes the last couple years in our society. Uh, it, it, they refer, it's a term they refer to as doom scrolling. Uh, doom scrolling is literally the act of consuming endless amounts of bad news, particularly online and through social media sites. So, you know, you climb in bed at night, you're getting ready to, to fall asleep, and you decide, I'm going to scroll social media for a little bit, and before you know it, you've fallen down the rabbit hole, and uh, you're drowning in, in just the doom that, that's out there. And so many Americans have fallen victim to this doom scrolling, and, and we've been talking this Advent season about the things that we want and the things that we need out of this season. We've been talking about things like peace, to know that we're chosen, a fresh start, and yet, as here we are, just kind of moments from our Christmas celebrations and all that, I wonder how many people are thinking, all I want for Christmas is some good news. Like, whatever's under the tree uh, for me this year, I'll gladly trade it. I'll gladly trade it for a little bit of good news in life. Because ultimately, that's what Christmas is supposed to be about. And so Christmas Eve rolls around and we, we stream into the church to sing songs and to hear a Christmas message and uh, you know, take a few pictures uh, at the photo booth or by the, by the Christmas tree as a family. But I wonder if we come here, if we came here tonight expecting good news or honestly expecting much of anything at all. And my job as a pastor is to share the good news. And we do, we, we, we do that every year at these services and all across town over the next few days, churches are gonna be meeting and pastors are gonna be sharing the good news over and over. But here's the thing, good news is only good news to those who see it. Now with our family, uh, with, with our, our kids and then our extended family, something that's sort of become a tradition is to pause kind of in the middle of, of everything and all the running around and all of the festivities and to gather everyone together and to read the Christmas story. And not the one with Ebenezer Scrooge and Tiny Tim, but the one found in Luke chapter 2. And so this year, I want to invite you into that moment as a church family, as we pause together, kind of in the middle of everything, and we open God's word and we read the real Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 1, says this. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child, and while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Now, every year we read the story. We've heard it before. We know it's supposed to be really good news. In fact, Luke is considered one of the four gospels, and the word gospel literally means good news. It comes from the Greek word euangelion, which just 
means good news. And it, what, this word wasn't originally a church word at all. In ancient Rome, euangelion or gospels would be shared by a herald in the public square for everybody to hear. So this was uh, R- Rome's version of posting something on social media. You know, like they, they didn't have social media. They just, they'd send a guy out into the street and he would just stand there literally shouting out the good news. And what they had been shouting about was Caesar. Caesar Augustus was the first Roman emperor, and most historians would argue he was also the greatest Roman emperor. Uh, He he replaced the former republic with this imperial form of government. He expanded the empire to include the entire Mediterranean world, and he ushered in this golden age of of Roman literature and architecture and uh, established what's known as the Pax Romana or the Roman peace. So when you look at this map of the Roman Empire at the time, you'll see just how vast this empire really was. In fact, some translations of this passage say that all the world should take a census because it really felt like it was all of the world. For decades, this entire area had been wrecked by war and destruction. Uh, Infrastructure had broken down. Robbers made the streets unsafe. Kidnapping was normative. Victims were sold into slavery. Trade was diminished. Interest rates were through the roof. Rome had completely completely lost its economic footing and its moral stability. And crime and, and immorality were rampant. And does this sound familiar to anyone? Augustus. This Caesar brought a stop to all of it, and he did so through sheer power. And in the eyes of the Romans, Augustus was great. He might even be a god. And they were proclaiming the gospel of Caesar. The problem is it wasn't good news for everyone. The peace they were experiencing was achieved by force, and it was only maintained through the use of that power, through the use of that force. So the rest of the world was hungry for a savior, but they were looking to Caesar, they were looking to the government, but ultimately a political solution wouldn't be enough. In his commentary, Kenneth Lauderite describes it this way. He said, Augustus and his successors had not solved the basic problems of the Mediterranean world, they'd obscured them. From what appeared to be a failure in government, they had substituted more government, and government was not the answer. This was the gospel of the first century world, and eventually the church just grabbed a hold of that term, gospel, or good news, and they began to apply it to the story of a man named Jesus the birth of whom we just read about in Luke chapter seven. They were proclaiming his birth was actually the real good news. And most of the world just didn't see it. And most of the world still doesn't see it. And here we are celebrating Christmas Eve 2022. And I'm wondering, honestly, if things have changed all that much. As I think back over the last several years anyway, I think of a nation divided politically, of a government making promises it can't keep, I see a world desperately looking for a savior and looking everywhere but to Jesus. I I see people who have read this story, who have heard this story, but who do not actually see the good news in this story. And so we gather together on a light night like tonight, we proclaim the good news that Jesus is born. He's who Christmas is all about. And yet I don't think we explain why it's good news, at least not well enough. And that's what I want to spend our time doing tonight. So let's keep reading our story. We'll pick it up with verse eight. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their their flocks of sheep, and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. That's supposed to be the good news. The problem is good news is only good news if you see it. Today in 2022, we have a perspective that they didn't have in the first century because Jesus was born and we've celebrated his birth our entire lives and yet the world is still an absolute mess. Now granted, we live in a time where bad news is what sells and misery is what keeps us coming back for more. Do you know what doesn't sell in the news cycles? All is calm, all is bright. And so 
We're constantly bombarded by bad news over and over and over. And, and many people will say, well, the birth of Christ was such a game changer. Then why literally 2,000 plus late years later is it still like this? How is the coming of Jesus such good news anyway? Let me ask you a question tonight. Did Jesus come for us or for himself? Listen, Jesus didn't give up heaven, come to earth, take on flesh, and become human for himself. He did it for you. He did it for me. He came for us. He came the way he did for us. He could have been born in luxury. He could have just appeared. He didn't do any of that. Jesus came. He was born. He was born in poverty, in simplicity, in humility, and in helplessness because that's where most of us live every single day. And that's what Christmas is really all about. It's about God coming to us and meeting us where we're at. The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, but when the right time came, in the fullness of of time, God sent his son, and this is important, born of a woman subject to the law. What does that mean? It means Jesus came to the world like us. He lived in the world with us. He faced all the crap with us so that he could one day die on the cross for us. And here's why that's important. Let's keep reading Galatians 4 verse 5. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave. You are God's own child. And since you're his child, God has made you his heir. Folks, that's really, really good news. One of the most loved Christmas carols of all time is the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And I think the words of this song capture so beautifully the good news that's contained in Christmas and the good news that we need to hear, need to see, but miss. Listen to these words. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above your deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by, yet in the dark streets shines an everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in you tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wondering love. O oh, morning stars together proclaim your holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming. In other words, we might miss it. But in this world of sin where meek souls will receive him still. The dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend on us, we pray. Cast out our sin, enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell, oh, come to us, abide with us. O Lord, Emmanuel, God, with us. Jesus came that quiet night while the world was shouting the gospel of Caesar, the real gospel, the good news was born in Bethlehem. And if you quiet your heart enough, if you truly listen, you already know deep in your heart, it's all about Jesus. It's always been Jesus. It's always been all about Jesus. The hopes and the fears of all the years are met in him. Tonight, the good news, the gospel is that he came to us and where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Here's the good news of Christmas. When things are hard, Jesus is with you. You're not alone. 
You're not overpowered. You're not outnumbered. You're not forgotten. You're not overlooked. You're not too far gone. Life is life, and life is real, but so is Jesus Christ. In this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart. He's overcome the world. So often we, we come to Jesus and what we're looking for in, in this season, what we're looking for in life is escape. If I, could just, if I could change this about my life, if I could fix this about my life, then things would be good. But true peace and joy are not dependent on our circumstances because Jesus did not come to deliver us from this life. He came to deliver us through it. All through scripture is this consistent picture when things are hard, Jesus is with you. That's what Luke 2 means. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you'll recognize him how? You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. This is what Christmas Eve is all about. It's about a God who loved you enough to come to you. It's about a world broken by sin and a God who sent his son Jesus right into the mess of my life. It's about a God who loves you, who sees you, who longs for you, who knows your hurts and your fears and frustrations, who knows your sins and your mistakes and your regrets and your shortcomings and who just loves you so much. And though he will not deliver you from this life, he would love to walk with you through it. All you have to do is choose to have faith, to believe he is who he says he is, to believe in Christ. Good news is only good news to those who see it. So I want to share with you tonight a story of someone in our congregation who saw the good news and it changed their life. Watch this. There were times that I would um, go outside at 3 a.m. and just scream out loud, like, Abba, Father, where are you? And the truth is, he never left me. Hi, I'm Amos, and this is my wife, Heather. Hello. Our life has been quite the journey. We recently went through quite quite a valley. On December 5th of 2019, um, I almost took my life due to mental health and alcoholism. We have four kids, and um, when we had our fourth, I was going through postpartum depression. I was so nervous about telling anybody what I was going through. Um, I was so good at faking it and hiding it from every single person that I knew until I couldn't anymore. Um, when they talk about alcoholism and the insanity that it brings, that's a true statement. Um, I was doing things out of character and we're talking majorly out of character. Like I could not grip who I was anymore. The day that I was going to take my life, uh, will you tell the rest? One of the reasons I'm a thousand percent sure there's a God and He loves us is because on this day, I was very determined to get to the office and work on my business. This is what I do. But on this particular day, I got 10 minutes into my 30 minute drive and I felt this strong need to work from home. And that's uncharacteristic of me. And I came home and I found Heather in bed. And I, I, at, this time I w at this time I was not aware of what she was going through. Um, and I called a friend and this friend came in and crawled into bed with Heather and said it's time. And changed the course of our life. This was a friend who had been praying for us. And as a godly woman, she knew what was going on. And she 
was the, the tool that God used to redirect our life, our marriage. When I was choosing to take my life that day, I was determined. I wrote my letter, and when Amos came home, I was not happy about that. Um, but I was so grateful that he did and that he listened and he paid attention to that strong urge that he had. And then when Kate crawled into bed with me that day and said, it's time, I knew that if I wasn't gonna die on that day that I had to live and I had to learn how to live. And it's been three years actually, December 5th of 2019. So we're on my three year anniversary of sobriety and these last three years have been the best years of my Gosh, I just feel like I have a blowtorch literally lit underneath, underneath my butt. Like I am on fire every day, all day long. From the minute my feet hit the floor, I strap on the armor of God because as an alcoholic, I can never let my guard down. Um, and I charge out into the world with my arms raised to the heavens and just I'm constantly telling God to use me, use me, use me, use me. And every single day he does. And it is powerful and it is awesome. The only way that we could have gotten through it is with Christ. If you're struggling, don't give up. You may not feel like he's there, but he feels your pain. He knows what you're going through. Don't give up. Life is real. We know that. But folks, so is Jesus. This, this, is, not a this is not a made up holiday. This is not a story for storybooks. This is the Evangelion. It's the good news. It's the gospel that should be shouted from the streets. Jesus is with you in the mess. After her interview, Heather said this. She said, I was at the peak of my addiction and depression. And I was doing everything I could to mask it, to hide it. After spending the day uh, sipping on the bottle in secret, I headed to church to Christmas Eve service, I think, with my family and my parents. And I arrived feeling pretty tipsy. And I remember avoiding specific pastors because I didn't want them to smell it on me or to take notice of my condition. My heart was very, very heavy that night. And I remember during one of the Christmas songs, I stood up and raised my hands to the Lord with tears streaming down my cheeks, crying out to him to take away my pain and to cure me of my horrific disease. I truly wished I would have had the courage to talk to someone then so I wouldn't have had to go through another whole year of suffering. And that year almost killed me. And then she found Jesus. Now, I don't know your story, but if you relate to her story tonight, the fear, the hopelessness, the, the questioning, I invite you. Jesus is really good news. And there's no reason to leave this place have, not having done something about it. Maybe you don't know him. Maybe you've not ever had a relationship with him. You've known about Christmas. But you've never known that Christmas was Christ's mass. It was his celebration. This could be your first Christmas. At least your first real one. Maybe you've claimed the name of Christ. You, you prayed a prayer at some point or whatever. But you're sitting here tonight and you're going, I don't have that. I don't know that I have, I don't know that I have been changed by Jesus. Wherever you are, whatever your journey, if you're in a place where you're saying, I need that, I just, I can't do it without Jesus. I'm gonna ask you to pray a prayer with me in a moment, but first I'm gonna ask you in the quiet this, of this moment, I'm gonna ask everybody to bow their head. And I'm gonna ask you to, uh, if that's you, if, if you're one of the people who said, I just, I need it. I need something to need to change. I need Jesus. I need something in my life. I don't care if I've said it before. I, I need Jesus. I want you to take the card that's in front of you in the, in the seat back. I want you to put your name 
and a phone number we can contact you at. And I want you to check the box that says, today I accepted Jesus. And I'm gonna lead you in a prayer right now, Father. For those in this room who are hearing the good news, maybe for the first time, maybe in a way they've heard it a hundred times, but for the first time it's making sense. It's real to them. Would you meet us in this place? Would you make your presence so fully known in this place? Forgive us, Lord. We accept you. We believe in you. We believe in Jesus. Would you help us journey towards you and with you? In Jesus' name.